Well, good morning. As we move into our time of prayer, I want to, um, many of you already know that this morning, uh, approximately an hour ago, um, Pastor Mealy was having a pacemaker implanted in his chest. And uh, I want to keep him in prayer. Um, I can only imagine what uh, he will be like when his heart is pumping at a regular pace. I think Pastor Mealy will be just fired up, ready to go, and just, he will give all of us a good good run for our money, I'm sure. He's been doing it as, it, as, it, as he has been doing it already, but um, man, to have his heart beating and correct and all that good stuff. So, um, but in, in all seriousness, pray for him and for his recovery. Um, people keep asking me how old Pastor Mealy is, and, and I said, you know, I don't know, 90? 91, something like that. One of the two, because, um, you know, you can't really ask him, because um, I'm supposed to know it, you know. So I guess I, I guess I have to go into the computer system in the office and figure it out, because um, I'm well, actually, let me just tell the truth. I'm scared to ask him, <laughs> okay? Let me just be honest about it. I'm scared to ask him, because uh, I, I, he'd probably get me. You don't, you know, I can hear him already. You don't know that. You, know, you don't know that, son. Uh, man, wow. <laughs> so, so, yes, I'm a big chicken. But anyway, um, let's pray for him. Pray for um, Sister Hazel, Sister Vera, um, Brother Ed Hobbs. Um, all of them are dealing with physical things and, um, and need our prayer. And we should be praying for them regularly. Um, also, I ask you to pray for uh, Robert Williams. Uh, you may know, you may remember Robert. Robert uh, uh, is um, Lena Dewey's significant other, and he comes to church on occasion. The former uh, Navy chaplain, and um, life has uh, given him twists and turns, and he's in a different place. But he's now um, in a uh, convalescent center recovery. But we want to pray for him. Our prayer text is found in the 149th Psalm, the fourth verse, in particular. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. And it's important for us to know that humility is never a posture of defeat. It's God's means of refreshing your heart and my heart. And we should be praying that our heart is aligned with God in victory. This morning we... um, We were led in worship by Megan Roundtree. And if you haven't been at the 730 service to hear Megan, uh, I am sorry for you. Because this morning was Megan's last Sunday with us after a year and a half. And uh, I shared with the pastors group uh, that meets once a month, I thanked her father-in-law, who is the uh, pastor of Hope in the City Church, up in uh, meets up in Fletcher Hills, uh, for sharing her with us for a year and a half. And um, one of the things that was amazing to me was I didn't know for the uh, the first month she was here that she was Pastor Eric's daughter-in-law. 
She didn't introduce herself as Pastor Eric's daughter-in-law. She introduced herself as Megan. And, it, and she talked with Jeanette and everything, and Jeanette took care of all of the, the, the things that needed to be taken care of to give her an honorarium because we, we blessed her each week for, with a little something. And um, so Jeanette knew her last name. I did not. So after about a month, I finally found out what her last name was. And I said, well, you know, the guy that referred you to us, he has the same last name. And she just smiled and said, that's my father-in-law. And I'm like, oh. And, you know, I mean, she could have introduced herself. And, and this is what I'm, I'm trying to get across to you. Her, the, she just had such a spirit of humility. Because she could have said, well, you know, Pastor Eric sent me over. I'm his daughter-in-law. You know, where's the piano kind of thing? And that's not, that was not the way she carried herself at all. And if you, ever, if you, if you did have a chance to, to be here and enjoy that, um, gifted uh, musician. Not that any of our worship leaders are not gifted, and, uh, but she just had a sweet, sweet spirit of, in a way that not that ours don't have sweet, sweet spirits as well. But you, you got me. She just had a, I'm just, just, yeah, let me just move on. She just had a way of, you know, leading us, and I appreciated that, and I wanted her to know that. And, um, and she, was, she was, you know, she always contacted us if she wasn't going to be here and all that good stuff. And, and um, she actually had recruited uh, someone to take her place. Um, which is wonderful. And then the lady that she um, had recruited to take her place also became pregnant. Just, Megan's due any day now. And so that's why Megan had to step away, because she's about to be a mother of two, and um, so wasn't able to do it. And her sister-in-law, um, another one of, well, Pastor Eric's, daughter she was going to do it but she's going through this thing called morning sickness <laughs> and leading the 7 30 a.m service when you're going through that is not a good thing so uh, so we're looking for someone else to come and lead us and 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 take up that role and responsibility and uh, I think we have a, a, a line on someone, but we'll see over the next few weeks. But thank you for, I, I'm just thankful for her, and I'm thankful also for the way we as a congregation treated her, uh, not as a stranger. And so this morning, I didn't say goodbye. I said, we'll see you down the road. You know, when we see this, you know, young mom with two toddlers, uh, <laughs> we'll be encur encourage her. So, um, but, but again, that's just when I think of humility, I thought about it. So I was looking over this the other night, uh, looking over our worship that God, you know, He lines up everything. And so to for us to be praying that, knowing that He crowns us with uh, He crowns the humble with salvation, that, and that humility is never a posture of defeat. And to have an example of humility uh, before us these last year and a half has really been truly amazing. And so um, I thank God for that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, our gracious and loving God, it is once again, Lord, that we come to your throne of mercy and grace. Thank you for the privilege of prayer. And Lord, we don't want anything to hinder our prayer. And so we ask, Lord, before we ask anything of, of you, we ask for forgiveness of our sins and cleansing of our unrighteousness. For Lord, we know that we have sinned by thought, word, and deed. But we are encouraged this morning that your word tells us that you are faithful and just to forgive us if we confess our sins. So, Lord, I pray that you would, again, forgive us of our sins and that you would 
Hear our prayer this morning. Father, we pray for Pastor Mealy, for his recovery. Lord, we pray for Mom Mealy, who's by his side. We pray for their entire family, that, Lord, that they are trusting you to do what only you could do. And, Lord, we thank you for the doctors and nurses and those who are attending to him. We pray, God, that you would give them, uh, Lord, just expertise beyond their experience. Lord, we pray for Sister Hazel. Thank you for her 91st birthday. We thank you for, for Sister Vera Morrison and pray, God, that you would touch her body as well. God, we pray for Robert Williams, that you would lift him up. We're reminded, Lord, by your word, that your word says that by your stripes we are healed. So we claim the victory over sickness and illness in your name, not in our own. And Lord, as we are gathered in this place, we're mindful of the gift that we have of freedom to worship in this country. Lord, the sacrifices that have been made, we can never repay. But we thank you that we have the privilege to come into this place and worship. So, Lord, humbly, I ask that you would think with my mind today, that you would speak with my voice. And I pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing and acceptable to you. I pray for Pastor Dan Bender, who is proclaiming your word at another church here in San Diego County. Pray that you would give him words to say to encourage them, for that church is going through a crisis. And Lord, we know that you are the one who can simply say to the waves and to the wind, be still. And the crisis will be overcome. Lord, I thank you for the fact that you've answered our prayers continually here at Meridian. And I pray now, Father, that you would use me as your instrument. That your word would not return unto you void, but would accomplish all that you would have it to accomplish. And Lord, I ask this prayer in the precious and mighty name of the Lord Jesus. With joy, thanksgiving, and forgiveness of sin. Amen. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to uh, John chapter 1, verses 40 through 42. But I want to, I by introduction, give you an explanation of the symbols on the front cover of your bulletin that are here on the on the wall behind me the first uh, symbol well first of all they are all symbols christian symbols that are for each of the apostles specifically for four apostles that we're going to meet in our prologue in the gospel of john Andrew, Peter, Bartholomew, or Nathaniel, and Philip. And just so you know, the, the, the one for Philip, there I couldn't find one with, with red. So you can imagine my ADD just really kicked in that I had to put this one symbol up there that wasn't like the other three. Really bothered me. It bothered me for two whole days. And I searched all over the internet, and, and I couldn't find one. So the... The top one, well, I guess, yeah, the top one on the left, the two fish that are crossed are, it's a symbol of 
Andrew, the apostle Andrew, who history tells us was crucified on an X-shaped cross. But you may remember also he was a fisherman. And we also know that in John chapter 6, or we will know in a few weeks when we get to chapter 6, that in that chapter he's responsible for, well he and Philip have the responsibility of bringing to Jesus the young boy that had five barley loaves and two fish. So that's why he's got the symbol of the two fish. Next to that one, the one with the inverted cross and the two keys, is for the apostle Peter. History tells us as well that Peter was crucified on a cross upside down because he requested that. He, was, he did not feel he was worthy to be crucified on a cross that stood straight up like Jesus did. His cross did. And the keys, remember, Jesus told him that he would be a rock and that upon him he would build the church or upon that testimony of who Peter was, that he would build his church and the gates of Hades would not prevail. Those keys got crucified with Peter upside down. Then the, the one underneath Andrew, the other, the last of the three red ones, is for the apostle Nathaniel or Bartholomew. And what you're seeing are three flaying knives. Whereas fishermen, they would, you know, they would clean the fish and they would cut the skin off. Well, Bartholomew or Nathaniel, history tells us that he was flayed. That literally his skin was cut off of him as he died. Now, oftentimes this particular, his shield can be a little bit, or his symbol can be a little bit different, because sometimes it will have, it will be an open Bible with the three knives sticking out from under the Bible. Because, of course, as an apostle, he proclaimed the word. And he was, he was killed because of that. And then the last one, with uh, what is commonly known as the Latin cross is the uh, symbol for Philip. And those two little things next to him, you probably could guess, yes, those are symbolic of loaves of bread. Because as I said in John chapter 6, Philip and Andrew brought the little boy who had the loaves and the fishes to Jesus. So that just kind of gives you a, a, an introduction, if you will, of over the next couple of weeks or so, the, the apostles that we're going to be talking about. Today, uh, the passage that we have, these three verses, the evangelist, John the evangelist, the apostle, he finds it necessary to indicate to his readers or to tell his readers about two or share with them two terms that they, they didn't know, which gives us a, a clue that they were not familiar with Jewish expressions. So, and these are very basic expressions. So we, so we know that, uh, it tells us a little bit about the audience but also tells us a little bit about the Gospel of John. Oftentimes, the, the Gospel of John is the first thing that we give someone when they, have a, when they inquire about Jesus. They want to know. Because the Gospel of John lets us know that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the, the, the whole theme of the Gospel of John, so that we will know for ourselves. And so you can imagine that with all of that, then we come to this, these three verses, and you're probably thinking, wow, that's, there's not a, a lot there. There's a whole lot here. And 
I'm going to try my very best in the next 30 minutes to, to walk us through. So let's, first of all, let's read the text. In John chapter 1, beginning at verse 40, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, or your translation may say Jonah. You will be called Cephas, which when, when translated is Peter. And Lord, add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Three things this morning that I want to try to convey that that you get. Andrew's concern, Andrew's conviction, and the fruit that comes from Andrew's concern and conviction. Andrew's concern is, it's pretty clear. Though he's Simon's, Simon Peter's brother, it says there that in verse 40, that when he heard what John had said and he had followed Jesus, verse 41 tells us his concern. It says, the first thing Andrew did was find his brother Simon. The first concern or the the central concern about or that Andrew had once he knew Jesus for himself was for his family. He had met Jesus personally. He had, he had the, the, that crying need of his heart had been answered. And the first person he wants to tell is his brother. He wanted to tell him, and, and so he, he desperately, I can imagine, just goes to tell Peter. And you may have heard that through time, as you've been walking with the Lord, as some of you are experienced with walking with the Lord, the, the question of who's the more, or who is the, yeah, who's the more effective evangelist, Andrew or Peter? Peter, we know, preached to thousands, and they came to know the Lord. But mind you, Peter would not have known the Lord had Andrew not been so concerned about him that as soon as he wrestled with it and knew in his heart that he went to go get Peter and tell Peter. And you can imagine, well, maybe you you can't, but... We know that Peter had an interesting personality, to say the least. He would cut you with a knife, cuss you in a heartbeat. Pretty passionate guy. So you can imagine Andrew going to get him. I, I don't know about you all. I mean, I, I'm, the, I'm the younger. I don't know if Peter, I, well, I should have looked it all up, but I, I, I'm the youngest brother. And I know that if I came to know the Lord first and I went to go get my brothers, my brothers would, get out of here. No, don't bring that. Because you're the little brother. You couldn't possibly know anything. But Andrew was, he was probably too excited and didn't care what Peter thought. But he brought Peter. And the one thing that I'll tell you that's interesting about Andrew is when we, we research Andrew or we look at Andrew in the Bible, Andrew's always bringing someone to Jesus. So you can wrestle with who's the better evangelist, but I know the consistency of the story and God's word that Andrew is bringing people. The evidence is here in, uh, in John itself, in John chapter 6. It says, and we'll get to that in a few weeks. It says, another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy 
with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they, they go among so many? And then John chapter 12, we'll find that, that when Philip brought the Greeks from Bethsaida that wanted to see Jesus, he brought them to Andrew, and then the Bible says that Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And we know that when Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. It tells us in Matthew chapter 4, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting their nets into the lake, for they were fishermen. And verse 19 says, Jesus says, come follow me, and, Jesus, and, they, and I will make you that famous line, fishers of men. And oftentimes we forget verse 20, where it says, At once they left their nets and followed him. They, meaning Andrew and Peter. So that's his, his concern, is his, his brother. Well, Andrew's conviction is also found there in verse 41. The second part of that verse, it says, we have found the Messiah. He knows that he knows that he knows that he has encountered Jesus Christ. No doubt about it. His conviction is firm. And so he shares, we found the Messiah. Now understand, this is an Old Testament term. And Peter knows that, and this is the, the first of those two terms that I was saying that John conveys to his audience. They need to know that Jesus is the Messiah. And the Old Testament said it was the promised Savior, Deliverer, who is believed to be the anointed one of God sent to redeem and save humanity from sin and bring God's kingdom on earth. And then in Christian traditions, Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Deliverer. And this Messiah, of course, is derived from a Hebrew word that means the anointed one. And when translated in Greek, it means Christ. So here, John the Baptist, or John, John the Evangelist, excuse me, John the Evangelist uses, it, uses the term Messiah to convey the message to his audience, but also he's saying, Look at what Andrew knew. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And he went and told his brother. And not, not only did he tell him, but then verse 42 says what he did. It says, and he brought him to Jesus. He didn't just go tell him. He literally brought him to Jesus. I don't know if you know, but people will come to church or they'll come to a Christian event to know the Lord if you'll ask. Most people, especially adults, when, when an adult becomes a Christian, it's because someone cared enough or someone was concerned enough about them that they invited them. Remember I shared with you just a few months ago, it seems, about the God Loves You tour down at uh, the amphitheater in Chula Vista. And the reluctance that I initially had to go, but I discovered there were a whole bunch of people that came there, a couple of thousand people who didn't know Jesus, but they came to that event because they were invited by someone else and they heard the gospel message from Franklin Graham translated through another person, and they came down and said, I want that. But they only did that because of the conviction of the person who invited them. So Peter gets to be in front of Jesus because, as it says in verse 42, Andrew brought him to Jesus. 
And then the last thing this morning, the fruit. Look with me at, the, look at what it says now, the, the, kind of the third sentence. It says, Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas. That's the second term. That will be translated Peter, which means rock. Jesus looked at him. The King James Version says, behold, or he be, beheld him, which means this wasn't just a casual glance. Remember, Jesus is God Almighty, was with God in the beginning, and was there at the forming of the world. And so Jesus knows Peter. So when he looks at Peter, this isn't just a casual glance. He's looking at him and he knows all about Peter just by looking at Peter. God knows all about each one of us. In fact, the Bible tells us that he knows the the, the number of hairs on our head. Now, don't laugh. Some of us are challenged in that area. But, but he knows how many are, are on our heads. He knows us that well. And so it means more than just a, a casual look. It's just an, an intense, earnest look, a, con, a concentrated, almost a stare. Because Jesus isn't looking at just the outside of Peter. He's looking at his inner being. He knows what he's struggling with. And then he says something. What Jesus says to him is, is prophetic. He says, you will be called. He's telling him, he's referring to the future. He's saying, your name's going to be changed. And this was, again, the... the prophecy of his conversion and changing of who he was. Peter, and, and I, you know, those of you who know me know that I, I love, love Peter because I believe Peter is a tremendous reflection of us. And so don't, don't be offended when I tell you that Peter was self-centered, defensive, overbearing, and carnal. And Jesus looked at him and said, you will be called Cephas. You will be strong, solid, immovable, and an unbreakable rock for God. Now, God looking at us well, it has two sides. It sounds beautiful. It sounds comforting. He knows everything about us. But it also should be a warning. Because he knows that deep, dark secret that we're trying to hide, that we think nobody else knows. That's true. Nobody else knows but God. And yes, it's great that he knows us personally. And John's going to talk about that when we get to chapter 2. He's going to say that he, didn't need, he did not need man's testimony about a man, for he knew what was in a man. Jesus already knows what's in us. He knows about us. Imagine, let's just for a moment go back and, and look at this. Jesus says to Peter, you will be called Cephas. Yet he knows that Peter's going to deny him. That Peter's going to fall and be embarrassed that he's going to deny any connection with Christ. But just as he knows he's going to deny him, he also knows that he's going to restore him. And he's going to know what kind of, kind of man Peter is going to become. Remember those army commercials? 
They used to come on, they used to say, you know, join the army and be all you can be in the army. Well, I'm telling you right now, when you make a profession of faith, you're going to be all that you can be in God because he knows what you'll be. I couldn't believe when I thought about that and thought deeper about that. I, I had no idea when, when I accepted the Lord, and I think I've shared this. I know I've shared it with my son. My, my, my thing was I wanted to be a deacon. I wanted to be a deacon like, you know, I thought I'd be sitting on the front row, legs crossed, you know, nice black socks on and all that kind of stuff and be cool right up front. That's where I wanted to be. And the next thing I know, when I, I, I when Pastor Winters gave the invitation, I came down and he put a microphone in my face and he says, what do you have to say? And I said, God's called me to preach. Where did that come from? <clears throat> That's what God knew he had for me. And I, you know, I think I've shared with you before that I, I was like, that's got to be, that was outrageous. I, I don't, don't like reading, you know, I'd rather be out doing stuff out, you know, playing in the sunshine and all that, but reading books and studying, oh, no, there's no way. And I have a reading disability, you know, things get twisted up and jumbled up. God, you can't possibly use me. Well, here we are, 20 years later, Meridian. Actually, 30 years, 30 years, um, wow. I've been in ministry 30 years, wow. I was thin and had black hair, wow. But Jesus sees the potential within a man and longs to change that man to make him everything he can become. Paul writes about it when he writes to the church at Corinth, when he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Then he wrote to the church at Ephesus. He says, surely you heard of him and were taught in him accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to, be, to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So when Jesus looked at Peter, and he said what seems to be a very simple sentence, you shall, you are Simon, son of John, you will be called Cephas. He was telling him, I see well, well beyond you in front of me, son. I see what you will become in me. So what is this this? This passage is, what is it saying all together? Well, after his encounter with Jesus, Andrew changed. After his encounter with Jesus, Peter would change. And as Christ's followers, we are changed. If we are born again. In fact, Peter says it in 1 Peter 1, 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. And then he tells us back in Ezekiel, and you all sang about it. I don't know if you all were, well, anyway. You sang about it. The worship team sang about it. Ezekiel 36 and 20, 26. I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. 
flesh, not immorality, but I will, he's taking, God's taken away that stony heart, that heart that is cantankerous, that is, has desires that are more evil than good. Desires that aren't for righteousness and holiness. And he changes our heart. He does an inner work in us. And just as he did for Andrew, he's calling us. Calling you and me. He's calling us to be a witness. Acts 1a, he says that, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. It doesn't say if. It says you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, or in all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. So where does this go? Where does this leave us? I'm so glad you asked. First of all, I want to ask you, who, who will you be concerned about? Is it a family member? Is it a friend? Co-worker? Maybe it's a classmate. Maybe it's not even a classmate. Maybe it's a teacher. Or maybe you're saying, well, I'm not, I don't really know. If you don't know, pray and ask God to give you a person or a number of people that you can be concerned about. I'm thankful today, being the, the last of my initial family, the, the initial part of the Slade family that brought me into this world, I, I'm, I'm blessed to know that every one of them knew the Lord Jesus because I was able to open my mouth and express my faith, even being the youngest. I was concerned about my family. I was concerned about my father, about my mother, my brothers. Who are you concerned about? And if, like me, you're left, that doesn't mean that your work is over. That just means you need to expand your circle. God's given you the desires of your heart that your family members are saved. But what about your friends? <coughs> or the circle of people you hang out with? Or as I say, maybe a coworker. Or maybe a classmate if you're in school. It may very well be a teacher. You don't have an option in terms of being a witness. Jesus said you will be a witness. And you're probably thinking, well, what will I tell them? Will I go through the Romans road? Will I lead them through the Four spiritual laws, will I show them the, the little color book? And No, what you need to do is tell them your story. Because your story really isn't your story. Your story, or the story that you're going to tell, is his story through you. That's what he's going to, that's what you're going to tell them. Because it's not about you. In fact, Jesus said it's not about you, it's not about me. We're going to talk about that in a few weeks when we get to John 15, where Jesus says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Why? Showing yourselves to be my disciples. See, that's what Christ followers do. They share Jesus so that other people will come to know Jesus and become Christ followers. We do that over and over again. But my brothers and sisters, we need to be, first of all, in a relationship with God. We need to be like Andrew. We need to be convinced that he is the Messiah. We need to know that he is our Savior and Lord. And the only way that we can know that for certain is to invite him into our lives and know that he answers that prayer. Then secondly, we need to begin being witnesses. 
And who do we witness to? Well, again, I'm so glad you asked. It says there in Acts 1.8 that we start in Jerusalem. Start at home. Start with your family members. And then kind of move out to the neighborhood. Your friends or your, again, classmates, co-workers. And then wherever God takes you beyond there. And, and you know there's that, the great part about that, when Jesus says we're going to be a witnesses or be witnesses, he says in all Judea and then he says in Samaria. And you know the Samaritans were hated because they were the half-breeds. They were the ethnic group that people didn't reach out to. God's not concerned about the ethnic group that you're, that you're worried about. He's already come to save them. He, what Christ did on the cross, he did for all of us, all humanity. And I know that's, that's another sermon on another day, and I went just from preaching to meddling because I made somebody uncomfortable. It's not me. That's the gospel. If the gospel isn't making you uncomfortable, you need to check your heartbeat. Amen? You might need to, no, I was, I was going to say you need to take Pastor Mealy's place. No, we need, to, we need to understand, my brothers and sisters, that we, that we are here for God's glory. As we believe that he came, he died, and he rose again, we're saved. We are, we are protected for all eternity. Now the, the question will be, would we share that in a dying world? In a world that's grown, grown, grown cold to the good news of the gospel. Now, like never before, we need to be bold. We need to be strong and courageous. We need to be like Peter. Be thankful for the Andrews in our lives. The folks who took the time to be concerned about us and invite us. We need to start there, inviting people. Inviting them to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Let's pray to God. Lord, we come now to this time of response. And Lord, there's so much that could still be said, but Lord, we need to take care of the first issue of our hearts. We need to admit where we are. Because the Bible tells us that each of us has a problem called sin. And Lord, we're guilty of that. Because none of us is perfect. And the result of sin is spiritual death. And eternal separation from you. Lord, we pray today. That as we examine our hearts, that we'll look into our own lives and, and confess where we are. Lord, we know the world could see us here and just assume that all is right with us, but we have never consciously and sincerely invited you into our lives. Lord, we believe that you came, that you, at your death on the cross, that you provided salvation for us and you paid the price for us. So I pray, Lord, that each here under the sound of my voice and maybe even those watching online would confess you as Savior and Lord. Lord, it would be great if all of us had the conviction of Andrew
that could enthusiastically say, we have found the Messiah, the Christ. We've invited him into our lives, and he has saved us. Lord, I pray that you'd also just touch our hearts, or that you would touch our hearts and give us a concern. Give us people that we're concerned for, whether it they be family members or friends or co-workers. Lord, you know who we associate with that does not know you. And I pray, Lord, that you would reveal those to us, those people to us, so that we can not only begin to pray for them, but we can begin to witness to them. And we can invite them to come along with us to see. For Lord, the fruit of Andrew's efforts yielded his brother to come to know you and to walk with you in a way, Lord, that changed hundreds and thousands of lives. Lord, uh, Andrew's no lesser an evangelist than Peter is. And we just thank you for his faithfulness to bring his brother, to go and get him, to bring him to you so that you could look upon him. Lord, I pray that you would give each of us in this place that opportunity. And God, we thank you. Thank you for your message to our hearts. Now we respond in a way that's pleasing and acceptable to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together.